Uh, open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. I am in Genesis 1-2 for my study. And I will continue this, this study next week as well, uh, the second service. When we, uh, when we read Genesis 1, 1 and 2, we saw, we saw something really of, of great interest to us, and that is that something happened in Genesis 1, 1. Something happened between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. There is no doubt about this. Something happened in Genesis 1, 1. God created the heavens and the earth to be inhabited. When we get to verse 2, the earth is uninhabited. Something happened between verse 1 and 2, and people call that a gap theory. Now, there are a lot of different views on the gap theory, but everybody believes there's a gap theory from that. They call it the gap theory. Now, what we know for sure from Isaiah 45:18 that the earth was originally created to be inhabited, but then became tohu wabohu, uninhabitable. And there was some type of divine judgment that caused it to be tohu wabohu. If you do a study on to tohu wabohu, that's made without form and void. Without form and void is how that's translated in verse 2. There, the, what's interesting in that let me show you, then we'll have a word of prayer. I mentioned to you the last time that there are three circumstantial was in verse 2. There are none. No wa opens up. There's no wa that opens verse 1 up. It's the only verse in chapter 1 that doesn't have an opening with a wa. It, it opens with a prepositional phrase, which is kind of interesting. But when you get to verse 2, you have... Those are two dots right there. That's, that's a wa, and that's a sagal. Not one you smoke now. That, and that's what we call a circumstantial wa. It's used three times. A, B, and C that tell us there are three distinct things that cause the earth to be uninhabited. So hold your place in Colossians for just a moment. Let's go back to Genesis 1, 2. I'm coming back to Colossians. Now, if you've been with us in our studies, we know what, what caused the earth to become inhabited. What, what caused the earth to become tohu wabohu, a koshed, which is darkness, and then mayim, covered in water. In verse 2 it says, The earth was formless and void, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving or hovering over the surface of the waters. The earth that had been designed to be inhabited, Isaiah 40, 45, 18, had become uninhabitable in verse 2. And we call that, in theology, they, somebody came up with the idea that there's a gap, and they called it the gap theory. Last week, I told you it was the cause of it, out of Isaiah, the cause was the fall of Satan. The fall of Satan. So that's for sure. So what we have what we have is we have the in verse 2 we have the earth circled in darkness circled in water. So here's the earth. Here here is darkness. Here's water, and over that is the Holy Spirit. Agreed? Yes. Well, that's what it says. I mean, I mean. Yes. All right? So that's important 
that we understand that. Here's the earth. Darkness covers the earth. Water covers the earth. And the Holy Spirit is the preserver, the protector of the earth. Right? It's only the earth. The heavens. We're not discussing the heavens. We're only discussing the earth. And we have darkness and water. The first three days of creation is, is going to restore these. First three days. If you study, you should study these six days of creation because all of this is going to be corrected in it. F verse 3 through 31. So that's where we are with that. This is where we are with our, our subject matter. Now let's go to Colossians. Where, wh the question is what does darkness represent to the earth? What does darkness represent to the earth? This, listen, the word darkness and the fall of Satan are connected. The fall of Satan produced the darkness to the earth. Here's what Paul writes in Colossians 1, 9 through 14. And by, but listen, I, di I didn't look in the, I looked in the Greek, but I didn't look in the English. Let's see, one, yep, yep, no. It's not going to be in the English. But in the Greek language, uh, Colossians 1, 9 through 14 is one Greek sentence. That means it's, it's one completed thought, even though it, it's broken down into verses. It wasn't originally written that way, of course. All right? So here, here's what it says. Here's what, Paul, here's what Paul writes. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, talking about the love of God in the Holy Spirit, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness, patience, and joyous giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance, watch this now, of the saints in light, with a capital L. For he rescued, watch this now, for he rescued us from the domain of what? Darkness. The domain of darkness. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Okay? So, what's important is I want to connect today the fall of Satan with the darkness of the earth. Why did, why did God cover the earth first with darkness and then with water? And what spiritual connection does spiritual darkness have with Satan? everything in the Bible. It has everything. That connection has everything to do with it. We're, we were sinners in darkness, and now we're saints in light. We were sinners in darkness of the domain of Satan, and now in the kingdom of the beloved Son, we are, we are saints of light. You understand that? Eh, well, you will by the day's, day's over. Hopefully. Okay? Last time, in the fall of Satan, we said there were three passages. Revelation 12, Isaiah, uh, 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 Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28. I took you to Revelation 12 because I wanted you to see the panoramic view of the fall of Satan from its origin to its final destiny. Okay? Okay? Today we're going to look at the connection of spiritual darkness that every person is born into as a human being. We were rescued and transferred from the domain of darkness. Every person that gets saved. And every person who's not saved is still in that domain of darkness. 
That's what Paul is writing about in our passage. So today we're going to look at four aspects of spiritual darkness associated with the fall of Satan and the connection between Genesis 1-1, the gap, Genesis 1-2, and then how God restored the earth in, in Genesis 1-3 through 31. The restoration of the earth is the subject of verses 3 through 31. So it's really important. Well, so let's open with a word of prayer, then we'll get into our morning uh, discussion. I give you a moment of silence. As a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit, it's your privilege and responsibility to confess personal sin. It could be mental attitude. It could be sins. It could be overt sins, sins of the tongue, whatever. First John 1, 9, if we confess him, that those sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, uh, to give us righteousness and cleanse us from all sin. So I give you a moment. Our Father, we're thankful today for Mother's Day. Didn't want to leave our subject matter because what makes Mother Day in America important is, is through Jesus Christ and how to get out of darkness and into light and what does it mean to be a, a saint of the light or a son of light? What does that mean? makes the entire difference to understand the theology of this in our marriages, in our families, in our churches, in America. And so I pray today, Father, you would teach us about spiritual darkness and how to overcome it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at point number one. The first important doctrinal point to understand is how Spiritual darkness became such a big deal to the earth as a result of the fall of Satan. He is what darkness is all about. And you'll see that today out of the scriptures. John explains something really important, and I don't, this is, if you forget everything else, don't miss this. 1 John 1 5. I mean, this is an absolute principle. Absolute. In 1 John, God is light, and him there is no darkness. God is what? And in him there is no darkness. John makes a, a, an enormous statement about this. He says, this is the message. We have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him. If you're in him, you're no longer in darkness. You're in light. The, you have been moved from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the beloved son. And listen what he said. He said, in him, there is no darkness at all. That's positional truth. That's positional truth. Because you have been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the beloved son, the kingdom of the beloved son. John writes, staying with the author John, in John 1, 4, and 5, he writes, in him, if you go to verse 14, he's talking about Jesus Christ. If you go to verse 14, he's talking about Jesus Christ. In him was life. Now watch, God is going to make a connection between light and life. And, he, and, and the whole idea of creation is about that principle. When we get to verse 3, he's going to restore the earth from uninhabitable to habitable. So he says, in him was life, and the life, this is divine life, this is the life of God. In him was divine life, and the divine life was the divine light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, didn't understand it. 
The only way you can understand you're in darkness is when the light of the gospel comes and opens your eyes to see that, there, that you were in darkness and there is an offer to you from the light of God. You can come out of darkness. Back many years ago in college, studying play, the Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and people like that, ran across this, uh, uh, a parable, a story that one of these great philosophers used about being enlightened. And he used the idea of a, people who had been raised generationally in a dark cave And he builds a story about living in a dark cave, a life without any light at all. And he said every once in a while there would be a generation that would come along that were just so curious that way up they discovered, way up into the crevices of the cave, there was talk of there being a light. However, they discouraged anybody to go find it because everyone that went on that journey never came back. And so they connected it with fear of being enlightened. Finally, one of them made it out and discovered a whole new world out there flowers and trees and sunshine and water and all those things. A whole new world existed outside that cave. So he decided that he should go back and tell them what was outside. When he did, they murdered him. And so it was in the age of the Greek Enlightenment. People don't know they're in darkness until they become aware of the light. God is light in him. There is no darkness. And yet all men are born in the darkness of Adam's sin, in the domain of darkness, because of the fall of Satan. That's the story of Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. You're going to eat. The day you eat, you go into death darkness. And all mankind is born into that. When I was a student in college as an unbeliever, When somebody shared with me Christ and the gospel, I thought, first of all, I didn't know if Jesus really existed, but when I discovered by checking the Bible out of the library that the man existed, I thought, well, you know, society got him like they get. I had read about stories like this and people with enlightenment, how people, other people kill them for fear of enlightenment, I connected it, that same idea with Jesus Christ. Well, you know, he just was one of those enlightened people, and they murdered him. What I didn't do is read the last two chapters that said, but God raised him from the dead. It changed my life completely to hear that God raised him from the dead because I thought he was just like all the other men who bucked the system, they killed him. We're all born in the domain of darkness through Adam's sin following the pattern of the fall of Satan. The fall of Satan led to the fall of man. And how are we going to restore him? We're going to restore him the same way God did. 
That's why Paul writes, the understanding of creation is very important to understanding God because creation is about the restoration. Paul writes in the first chapter of Romans. It's a very interesting, it's a very interesting idea that Paul gives us. Darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus said in John, the first chapter of John 11, 12, and 13, he said, he came unto his own, and, his, and, the, and the own did, not only did not receive him, but they murdered him. A man of enlightenment. In John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, who was writing to us from the book of Genesis, but and grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in, in John 12, 8, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. He will have the light of life. All members of the Godhead our spiritual light, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, our spiritual light. What held the whole world in the fall of, of Satan was the Holy Spirit, which was light hovering over the water and the darkness over the earth. Listen to me now, because you miss this. That power lives in your side, your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What don't you know that your body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, dwells inside you and your body is no longer your own? It's been purchased through Christ's death, burial, resurrection. Not only is he the son of light, but he's the son of life. Spiritual light, spiritual life. John has written well on that subject matter. In John, the 12th chapter, verse 36, John wrote, while you have the light, believe in the light, is what he told his disciples, because Jesus was about to leave. And the Holy Spirit was going to bring back the light. Listen to me, listen to me. When Jesus hung on the cross, the last three hours where he suffered for the sins of humanity, what was it? Dark. Over the surface of the earth, darkness. And what and what did the resurrection bring? Light. The light, the light of life. You've got to know this stuff. You've got to know this stuff. That was John 12:36. You're a son of light, one of the 20 status privileges of being a church age believer. One of 20 status privileges, you're called the son of light. At the point of salvation, you become a child of light, a son of light in Christ. It's positional truth. You will always be in the eyes and heart of God. You're always a son of light in Christ. Here's my second point. Let me get down here. Here's my old deal. Draw you two circles down there. Put a dot in it. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says, we all are born in Adam, Spiritually dead. Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so it spread upon all mankind. We have, that's out of Genesis 2.17. 1 Corinthians 15.22, In Adam... All die. Spiritually death. That's spiritual death. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says, In Christ, 
all are made alive. Okay? All are made alive. The question is, how do you get from being in Adam where you're physically born into Christ where you have to be spiritually born? How do you get there? Well, the answer is that Christ dies on a cross. He's buried and he's raised from the dead. Colossians 13, 14. 13, 14. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. Here we are in the domain of darkness. We are rescued by the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the gospel is declared by Paul to be that he died. He died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead according to Scripture. All right? Romans 1, 16, when you believe, you receive. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive salvation. Salvation is the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. That's what Romans 1 says. To everyone who does what? Believe. Believes. Believes. You've got to believe the gospel in order to be saved. When you do, then you have Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. The moment you believe that, the moment you believe, you are rescued. Like, like a, you're enslaved in the domain of darkness. You're, you're stuck. You can't get out. Christ is the light out. When you believe the gospel, you are rescued from the domain of darkness and you are transferred into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That's the kingdom of light. You understand that? Here we have Galatians over on this side, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by, the, you know, the power, the system, the power system of grace. Galatians 2.20. That's a very important. 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new cre a new what? Creation. A new creation. A new creation. A new new from what? From old. It's, it's really important that you get that. Um, here's some verses you ought to get down. Romans 5.8. Because it talks about a former life, and every believer came from a former life, a domain of darkness, and, and it talks about uh, now. Formerly you were in darkness. Paul says, formerly you were darkness. He says, now you're saints in light, the light of God in Christ. He says, but now... Now you are saints in the light. Formerly you were darkness. Now you're saints in light. That's positional truth. Everybody, that's one of 20 status privileges. Everybody has that through salvation. <coughs> Here's Colossians 1.12. Colossians 1.12 reminds us again that we are sons or saints. We are, we are saints sons of light we are sons of light like like Romans 5:12 we are sons of light and we are saints of light Romans 2:19 let me pick that up listen to 2:19 we are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. This is people who are sitting in Paul's Bible studies that he's talking to. We, 
and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, spiritually blind. Let me tell you why that's important. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 in a moment. And who is the guide to those who are blind? Well, we are the guide to those. We are to be guides to those who are blind so that they can see. We are the guides. Listen, he says in verse 19, that you yourselves are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness. Do you get that? If you didn't write that on your paper, it's not on your paper. I don't write any of this stuff on your paper. If you didn't write any of that stuff, you ain't got any of it. All right? So let's go to 2 Corinthians, because I put up, up here. Here's 2 Corinthians. You know, you come to Bible class. Anybody can go to church. This is Bible class. Listen to what he says in this, this is 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled in the mind, it is veiled to those who are perishing in the domain of darkness. One of the 13 judicial charges upon all mankind in Adam is perishing. You know, it's John 3, 16. You know what the opposite of perishing is in John 3, 16? Run it through your head a moment. Run it, warn John 3, 16 through your head. What's the opposite of perishing? Eternal life. Life. In whose case, where the gospel is veiled to the perishing, in whose case the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones. In other words, those who have gone negative volition to divine truth of the gospel. He... That per, now, he has a right to them because of volition. They turn their back on the gospel of Christ. That makes him, all, that they are fair game in the angelic conflict. In whose case the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the ones unbelieving ones so that they might not see, watch this, so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What is he talking about? He's talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Who is the image of God? Watch this. Talking about this rescue. I'm going to the book of Acts 26.18. 26. 18. 26 18, 26, 18. Now, it's kind of a long one. To open their eyes, he says, rescue you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. To open, he's sending missionaries, you and I. To open, see, a guide to the blind. W what are we supposed to be? A guide to the blind, right? Who's the blind? All those who are perishing. We're a guide to the blind to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light, from the domain of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Whoa, there's a whole lot of doctrine there. Man, we could spend weeks on that one verse. There is so much information in that one verse. We are guides to the blind to bring the gospel to them because the gospel is the light of God. 2 Corinthians 4. 4 is the light to shine in darkness. And the Holy Spirit, who is light, will take it over when volition accepts it. That's an amazing program that God has, people. 
That's an amazing program. Point number three. Our lesson text, Colossians 1, 9 through 14, is one Greek sentence that explains what it means to be a member of the kingdom of the beloved son as sons of light. Now, I don't want you to miss this because when we read through Colossians 1 through 14, it did not click. It never clicks until you stop and let the Holy Spirit teach you. Stop reading the Bible, read a little bit, and stop and let the Holy Spirit tell you what it means. Is it his job to teach and recall? John 14, 26. Teach and recall. Let him teach you. You don't get it by just reading it. You read it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Read a little bit and say, explain that to me. And he'd be glad to do that, right? Of course he will. If you allow him, you know, if you come to church, I'll teach you. If you don't come to church, he'll teach you. We're both teachers. Now watch. Well, I want you to see this because I, I know you missed it and you probably wouldn't pay attention to it. So my job is to bring awareness to you. I hope you will fall in love with the study of the Bible is what I'm about. So what he does is he introduces us to what it means to be sons of light. And he gives us seven characteristics of sons of light in the world. This is your light. It's your life, light, life, light to the world. There's, and if you're, a, if you're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ through faith, saved by grace, this message is for you. Be a guide to the blind with the gospel. And he says your life is the light to the world. Your life. Not just your message, your life. Listen to what he says. I'm going to go back to Colossians, and I'm going to show you the seven things that Paul says make up your life as light of God. In verse 9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, and this is what they're praying do you pray for one another like this? You should, right? Since the day we heard of it, the, the, some of the problems, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled, number one, that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's the first thing he said. Now, the word, listen to me, the word fill, play role. Oh. It means to fill up a deficiency. To fill up a deficiency. A fi to, listen to me now. To fill up a deficiency of ignorance. I don't mean you're stupid. I don't mean you're dumb. I mean you're ignorant of certain issues in your life. How do I know that? Watch this now. Watch this now. That you may be filled with what? The knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Knowledge is what corrects that, that ignorance. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, okay. That's fair. So study and find out. Paul was praying that the people going to his church would, be, would, would fill up a deficiency of ignorance by, listen to me, see the word knowledge? It's epinosis. I put it on your paper, I imagine. Epinosis. That's knowledge that is ingrained, has been ingrained by the Holy Spirit. You, that's gnosis in you that you're able to explain epinosis to other people. You have just now become a guide to the blind. Well, they say, Ron, what do you believe about salvation? Well, I could teach them, right? What, what about this and what about that? Why do you think God has got you in Bible study with a guy like me?
It is to correct areas of ignorance, scriptural, spiritual ignorance in your life to bring you to out of that, not understanding. Look what he says. Look what he says. To the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I mean, you know it well enough to explain it to somebody else, right? So you need to be filled, fill up a deficiency with the knowledge, epinosis, of his will. Pay attention, when Paul goes through this list, this is one Greek sentence. When he goes through this, pay attention to the prepositions. What often we miss in the Bible are not big words, it's the small words. You should always pay attention, when Paul's writing especially, to prepositions. You should pay attention to every writer's verbs. But you should pay especially, a special attention to Paul's prepositions that are associated with key verbs. Because that's where he teaches his theology. Did you notice this? Watch this now. Starting with the word be filled. Be filled with is with a preposition? Yeah. With the knowledge of, is that a preposition? Yeah. In, is that a preposition? Yeah. Do you understand? All those prepositions are the teaching that comes out of the major verb, filled. Filled with, filled of, filled in, you got to pay attention to that stuff. That's where he lays out his theology. Then he comes, look at verse 10. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we got the word walk. That's peripateo. That means in every activity of your life, there's no place that your body is that the Holy Spirit's not, right? Your body can't, <laughs> he dwells with you forever. John 14, 16, he indwells you forever. Wherever your body is, he's there, right? Okay. So wherever your body is, that's called walking. That's the activities of your life in Christ. And how should you walk? Watch prepositions. You should walk how? How should you walk? What's the preposition say? In. Watch this now. You can't forget this now. Watch prepositions. In a manner worthy. Is the word in a preposition? Yeah. How about of? Walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. See, that's, that's 1 John 1, 7. See, you should pay attention. I gave you a lot of scripture. In Psalms 119, 105, it says you should walk in the word because the word of God in you is a light to your path. Think about that. As you're walking around, you've got this, you've got this, this is better than the sun rays, right? Beating off a what do you call that thing they Solar system, you know what I mean, that you have on your house or whatever. Yeah, it produces power, right? I probably never have one because I can't explain it. I don't understand how they work, but I don't even know what they are. Walking, walking, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Right? In a manner worthy of the Lord. Not just walk worthy, but walk worthy in a manner of the Lord. And I gave you scriptures for that. Then he goes to pleasing. Right? 
he goes to pleasing, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might to attaining. Well, where's my pleasing? Well, anyhow. Verse 10. Verse 10. Please, oh yeah. Pleasing him. So that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Right? I got, I got three different deals here going. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Let's see. Write this down on your piece of paper. I didn't put it. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Wow. 11.6. You, you need that one. I, I thought about that this morning coming in. Without faith... Without operation of the faith cycle in the life of a believer, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who seek him. What a powerful verse that is for you. You ought to write this verse down on that same page I thought about. 1 Thessalonians 4.1. That's a powerful idea. And of course, Ephesians 5. Let me back up to that. 5, 8, I put 8 through 13. I'll just read a little bit of it. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the, light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light, divine production, consists in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then he goes on, don't become participants in darkness and unfruitful life. Right? So these are important. Now, he tells us in that verse 10, bearing fruit, that's divine production. That's another important avenue of our life. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Bearing fruit. Now, I'm going to show you something that you can't see. Now, you can see fruit is a divine production, like Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit right? But see the word increasing in this verse? Divine, uh, bearing divine production in every good work? Increasing. See the word increasing? That's not a good translation of that word in just my opinion, because this is a word oxano, and it means growing. It's a word for growing. It's not just a, a, a fruit tree, but it's a high-producing fruit tree. It produces some of the best, you know, whatever. And increasing in the knowledge, okay? Incre bear fruit, this is number one, bear fruit and increase that spiritual growth in knowledge, listen to me, epinosis. That's epinosis. We recently, on Tuesday, did a parable of the sower dealing with divine production out of Luke 7, 36 through 50, I wrote in your paper, and he talks about divine production. And divine production depends on what God wants to put through you, how much he wants to put through you, is always going to be good. He is either going to put 30 through you, 60 through you, or 100 fold. And it's going to be based on your, on, on your potential with your growth. And he just funnels it through you to others, right? Hmm? Strengthen. That takes me to 11. Strengthen with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience and joyous. Right? And joyous. Now, what's interesting is the word strengthen is a verb, and the word power is the same word in a noun. In other words, dunamo oo is strengthened, and the word power is the noun form of that, dunamis. So you're strengthened with power, it's in the same act, like if you're a weight lifter, and they put 200 pounds up there with you, 
if you had the strength, had the strength, uh, the power, had the strength of the power, you could push that 200 up and you could rack it. Agreed? You understand it? Power and strength go together. Power and strength go together. You can only lift as much as you have the strength. Right? And that's how we identified as power. Strength with power. Now remember, you're always looking at prepositions. Strengthen with some power, all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness, patience, and joyous. Right? Do you know what you don't see there? See the word patience? There's two. Di there's different Greek words. This is a word that means long suffering. And you can find this word again in Galatians five twenty two and twenty three, the fruit of the spirit. Strengthen with all power according to his glorious might. You know what that is? That's kwatas. That's a different word. That's kwatas. And that means the omnipotent power of God. Strengthened with all power according to the omnipotent power of God for the attaining of all steadfast activities and long-suffering of a joyous journey. Think about that. Because God had put you anywhere where he's not with you, will be with you, give you the strength to lift whatever you've got to lift can be lifted by the power of God in your life. And you have all that. You have all this. this is, you're not void of any of this. You just don't tap into it. You'd rather sit around and whine and cry. Suck your thumb. You got all of this access in your life and you don't take advantage of it. That's, I don't understand that. That makes no sense to me. That makes no sense to me. Then he says, giving thanks to the Father... Boy, I'm going to tell you. You know, you, you know how you can tell well or not, whether or not you're going into some phase of maturity in your life? Because no matter what the circumstances are in your life, you are always giving thanks to the Lord. See, this word giving thanks is the Eucharist. That's having an attitude of how gracious God is to your life and how your life needs to be that to another person. A husband to a wife, a wife to a husband, parents to children, a pastor to a congregation, a congregation to its membership. This is a powerful idea, people, giving thanks to the Father. I was talking to a person today about this very thing on Mother's Day. Listen, giving thanks is important to your life. It's important for you to tell the Father. Instead of whining about your problems, he's put them there to muscle you up for what he's got planned for your life. You don't walk into a gym and out of shape and push 200 pounds up without getting hemorrhoids. I mean, you have to start, you have to work your, you have to work your way into it. And listen, giving thanks to the Father. It don't matter what your circumstances are. 
I mean, some of the some of the greatest ministry of my life was with my wife on her deathbed. Holding her hand and giving thanks to the Father. That she was about to pass into where we all look forward to go. What a glorious time that was for me. What a glorious time that was for me. Giving thanks to the Father. To be a part of that journey. To be a part of that life. To encourage her that she was going to go from light to light. She was going to go from life to life. Giving thanks. The greatest ministry I've ever touched in my life. Sharing. Sharing in the inheritance of the saints of light. Well, in the fourth point, it would do well for you to study that because I'm out of time now. You need to really look at that. People don't pay attention to where Satan's going to wind up out of this whole mess. But it'll be important. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering, then we'll take a break. Well, our Father, we're thankful for these that come with open Bibles and minds and hearts for their relation with you to develop into an epinosis, not just a I, I know, but a confidence in it that we can share with others and they can know and break through the lack of knowing to give them the confidence of their life. I pray for this offering today, Father, that we'd be good stewards of your, of your grace to us and what we have, that we may use it to further the kingdom's work. In Jesus' name, amen.